I wish I loved working at home. I really do. But it is, wouldn't it? A designated workout space because I live in an 1100 square foot condo, which would be fine, except I made some life choices that didn't give me a workout space in my 1100 square foot condo because I didn't know I was going to live through a pandemic. Um, right. Right. No one told me. Yeah, that would have been helpful. Come on. Pass. We need a warning. <laughs> Welcome to the Discomfort Zone. We are the Casual Fanatics. I'm Paul Stadden. That's Jeremy Brazell. That's Sydney Johnson. And this is the show where we have to get out of our comfort zones and go into places we really didn't want to have to go. And it may be something that is in our genre. Like you don't like horror. So, hey, we have to watch a horror movie. Or maybe you don't like a certain kind of music. Or maybe it's just something you're unfamiliar with and you never got the chance to listen to. Well, we challenge each other every single week to something new, and this week is going to be really fun and really interesting because I actually liked my challenge. Did you guys find this happen with you guys where you liked your challenge? Actually, I, did you too, Jeremy? Did we all like our yep. challenges this week? We'll, uh, we'll see. Okay. You don't – yeah, oh, great. He doesn't even want We'll to find out. Fine. It's okay. <laughs> Go on, uh, you, know, you know, the thing is – it doesn't happen very often uh, where we get to have a show that's like largely positive, but this is what actually excites me. Uh, maybe it's just the COVID getting to me that I really want to have a lot more positive things in my life that I'm trying to, like, I haven't watched Mystery Science Theater 3000 in forever, and that was a guilty pleasure for so long, making fun of bad movies, but now I just keep thinking to myself, I want good things and great things and interesting things in my life, you know? I'm in the same boat as you right now. Yeah. Like it's just gotten to me and I'm just like, I just need happy and sunshine. And I'm not like a sunshine and rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Because again, we are pushing ourselves. I think the COVID thing has actually helped us show out a lot because <laughs> uh, we've had more opportunities to see things that we haven't gotten the opportunity to than we ever have. Time. We've had more time. Yeah, exactly. Well, I was really actually apprehensive about my challenge this week, but was really happy about how it turned out. I was challenged by Jeremy to watch the movie Parasite. Now, it's an Oscar winner, and it's everybody loves it. So that immediately was putting me off of it because whenever somebody says, oh, you have to watch this thing that everybody loves, there's still that part of me that I've really tried to deal with and suppress that says, oh, it's really popular. I'm going to hate it. I don't know why I do that. It's stupid. I knew it. It's I a knew hold it. over. I know. I Theory. Contrarian. Yeah, I'm a contrarian. I that you were still that contrarian, and now you finally admitted it. Well, it's I'm a suppressed contrarian. I I go to com contrarians anonymous, and we all admit to each other. <laughs> um, I'm Paul S, and I don't want to be here. And like, yeah, you do. So, <laughs> Parasite was, and, and the thing was, I think did somebody say it was a horror movie because it's no. Not a horror movie. Okay, because I thought somebody had said that it was a horror movie. Uh, I think maybe I read part of the synopsis a little bit ago where this this family uh, of very poor people in South Korea kind of ingratiates themselves into the lives of these very, very wealthy people uh, and slowly kind of infiltrates into their house. Um, and it's really a fascinating character study on – class structure on wealth and poverty uh, and, the, and kind of how you get sucked into a role um, because it all starts out very innocently in Parasite where this this kid is uh, going out of the country to, and he says to his friend hey can you teach this person English this this girl English and he says yeah I, I can do that um, so it starts out innocently and goes to the family and then he kind of lies a little bit about you know does he have college training well okay i didn't really get the degree so we make a fake one online uh but I, i'm gonna go to college i'm gonna get the real degree and then he gets his sister in to teach art to the young son and the lies just compound and then the father becomes the driver uh and they get rid of the original driver of this wealthy person like really scummily like they they insinuate that he's like a uh having sex in their car in the car of the wealthy people and so they fire him uh and then the housekeeper so they can get the mother in they get rid of the housekeeper and they 
like accuse her of having the tuberculosis uh, and they use her allergies of peaches against her. And then you find out that her husband is living in the basement the whole time. And it just devolves into this, this web of lies and there's murder. So look, I, we're going to spoil this movie. So if you're planning on seeing Parasite and you're seeing this podcast before you go see Parasite, just know that spoilers here in just accept that <laughs> so and the reason that we have to discuss the spoilers is because the one thing i didn't like about the movie is going to absolutely ruin the ending for anybody who hasn't seen it uh now and jeremy watched it before we did this but that's okay. oh dang it well just put cotton in your ears and sing la 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 yeah, all the time. Okay. The, look it, it's one of those movies that even if you know really what happens it. it's still thoroughly worth watching yeah, it's I don't. I don't feel like in this case it will ruin it because, like, I sort of I know enough about the movie to like know the synopsis right. and wanted to watch it. So I'm like, I'll still probably watch it. So. And you should. You really should. It's an excellently made movie. Um, the one thing I didn't like about it is that the sister dies. Um, okay. I feel like it was unnecessary. Um, I know that for art's sake, having everybody live is not acceptable but i feel like the wrong person died at the end of the movie okay. um i feel like either the main our main character the son uh should have been the one to die because he was the one that instigated all this in the first place and would be much more poetic or the dad who they keep hinting that he has mental instability throughout the whole thing that he has anger issues um there are little glimpses of it here and there uh and he absolutely like whenever somebody insinuates uh, that somebody that he's poor or that uh, there's this weird odor that he has like, Oh, it's like the, the subway. It's like, he smells strange that he just riles him up. And finally it culminates in him for some reason, stabbing to death, the wealthy owner of the house, the, the wealthy guy that, that hired them all. Um, and if anybody was going to die in the movie, I really feel like it should have been either the son or him. I feel like killing the sister was just kind of, I don't think she was, there's no story reason to me why it was necessary for her to die. There was nothing that was foreshadowing it in the movie, um, unless I missed something specific. Um, but it's a phenomenal, fascinating. And that aside, I would totally watch this movie again and analyze it because uh, it's an incredible delving into the lengths that people will go to to be able to better themselves and better their lives um, and the justifications for what you do and the justifications for um, being able to even push other people out of the way. Like, you know, it's, it, it's very easy to make it kind of like a, a, just a total class warfare story where it's just rich versus poor, but it's much more nuanced than that because it really is just survival. Um, and you have these these people who will justify, okay, well, yeah, we did get the fi driver fired, but I'm sure he'll find other work. Or, yeah, okay, we got the housekeeper fired, and we did you know, rile up her allergies, but I'm sure she'll find something else. So it's this whole thing of, yeah, I know life is tough for me, and I never found anything that was really good, and I just got these people kicked out on the street, but I'm sure they'll be fine. Like, these weird justifications that we do as human beings um, – so I was thorough, I thoroughly loved that movie, um, and I didn't think I would. And it's subtitled. Uh, the first, the moment that movie turned on, I'm like, ah, I can't browse Reddit while it's on. I got to look at the screen the whole time because <laughs> I was expecting it to be unpleasant. I, I do admit this, but I will because I have a subtitled movie as well this week. Um, yeah, yeah. And I actually have a thing for foreign films. I really do. Um, I went on a bender for like three weeks where all I watched was Danish movies. Um, I, I like it. I feel like there's a lot of countries that make films in ways that we in America don't see very often and like yeah. it brings something to the table. So I'm all about like watching films that are made by other cultures, mm -hmm. but I do, I'm definitely on your level that like, the problem is like, I don't really sit down and watch TV. And when I watch a subtitled film, I have to sit down to watch it. Yeah. yeah. I'll get into this more in a minute, but like I do feel you because like you're me, like I can't read at the same time, and well, I can't. And 
And this is the thing. I think people make fun of people who don't like subtitles. And I find that a frustrating thing because when I'm watching a movie, there are two things I really love about it. Number one, uh, obviously the visuals. And Parasite is incredibly visually rich. Every frame looks like a painting. Uh, mm-hmm. It's composed. It, it's, it's like if you go back to Ang Lee directing Sense and Sensibility, uh, where he made every single frame of that movie look like an English master painting from the 1800s. It's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Parasite looks like it has the same level of composition, color, richness. There's an art to what it looks like. And to have to continually take my eyes off of the thing that the director wants me to focus on to read dialogue is frustrating. Um, and the other thing I like about- We're, We'll movies, talk more about this when I come around. Go on. Go, yeah, I know you're going to, because your movie is also, I, I feel very similar to this, mm-hmm. where there's a, this rich visual narrative. And not only do I not like having to shift my eyes away from the point where the director wants me to point to, but I like hearing good voices. I, I revel in sound. That's what I do. And so hearing voice actors, hearing the tremble of a voice as they're trying to get this word out or searching for the right word or a voice that's commanding and booming in a language I understand, that to me is half of the emotional weight of any scene. And to be mentally going back and forth, looking, reading, applying the emotion I'm hearing in the voice to the words I'm reading it's a little distracting. I like a really good dub job. I think that the dub of uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was excellent because it was actually dubbed by the actors in the movie, dubbing their own voices into English. Uh, so that helps that a lot. Help. That, that was, helps a that lot. Help. I've, when it comes to live action, dubs are Terrible. so awful. For me. I, I can't I can't handle doves in a live act. Like, they have to be good. They have to be really good. I I've I like because I've seen the one I've accident I accidentally saw the one with Crouching Tiger because I wanted to watch watch it in the original language and it started mm-hmm. and immediately it's like these flaps aren't working. Netflix out. likes to do that and yeah. I don't like the Netflix likes to do that. Stop yes. making my foreign films in English. Like don't oh, yeah, have- yeah. you made a choice like, anyway. I, I tried to watch the show Dark, and it started in English. It's like this is supposed to be. In and you're like, this is weird. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, and that's fair. You what's going on? Now, animated stuff dubbed. I absolutely. I mean, yeah. Akira. I watched Akira in the original Japanese with subtitles, and I've seen both the 1988 Pioneer dub and the 2001 or two. I think it's 2001 Orion dub. Um, so I've seen it in three different ways, and. To me, nothing beats the original Pioneer dub from the late 80s. It's, there's something about the over-the-top, because uh, vo- they're all voice actors from cartoons, like uh, Cam Clark from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is in it. Um, they have some Americanized names that they use. Like, instead of Ryu, it's Roy, and instead of mm-hmm. uh, Kai, it's K. So they Americanized they've some got, of the names. They've gotten away, um, in, and we won't get off on this topic, because like that's a lot. We can talk a lot about this. Um, yeah. they've gotten away, I feel like, in anime dubs from Americanizing the names, which is yes and no for me, because, like, on right. the one hand, like, I don't think they should Americanize the names, but on the other hand, it makes I a get lot it. of remember. Like, <laughs> and that's the thing for me is, uh, and look, I love Akira. It is a, it is a thoroughly Japanese story. You can't, the, the whole thing where they were going to do the uh, live action, upcoming live action one set in New York, I'm glad that got scrapped. They really need to hire actual Asian actors for the movie, by the way, uh, because it is a thoroughly Japanese story. It's as Japanese as Godzilla, because it's all about nuclear war. Um, and it's a fascinating movie. And But he, being able to latch my mind onto characters is really important for me to be able to follow a narrative. Mm-hmm. And it's also, as long as you're dubbing it in English, like why not Americanize the voices because you already have American accented English voices. Like you've already gone that far. If you're going to call that guy Roy, fine. Because it sounds a little weird to hear, yep, me and Kenosha, we're going to go down with Tetsuo over to see Takashi. Like, okay, that's not going to happen. Um, I think it's only the only problem and like without getting off into a dubbing conversation, um, I think we the only did. problem we are, but we need to like bring it back in. 
Um, <laughs> I think the only problem with that is that there are some, like, a lot of times details of the story get changed and yeah. there are things that get changed in that process that I think probably shouldn't. Um, yeah. But I see what you're saying. I, on the names, I sort of see, because I grew up with that kind of dubbing and it's it certainly does make it easier to remember, you know. Yeah. But as far as like foreign films go, no, I'm I'm very much a purist, and like if I'm going to watch a foreign film, I am going to sit down and watch it as it was intended. Because the dubs yeah. are never good. They're, just They're never, never good. good. It's true. And until we get really good deep fakes, uh, where you can just do the <laughs> actor's lips again. But Jeremy, right. I'm actually really curious. What was the one thing you didn't like about Parasite, and was it the same thing that I didn't like about Parasite? Interestingly enough, it wasn't, I'm trying to think back right now exactly what it was, because now it's been a little bit. It, it's so good that it does obscure it any do, dislike. It, it had to do with the sister as well, and more of her storyline being the least believable. So that almost ties into yeah. I think it was the least fleshed out. Um, well, no, not the least fleshed out because the dad is very mysterious um, because they don't get into his backstory very much and what his anger issues stem from. But the, da the daughter, the sister, is incredibly good at uh, graphic design. They don't own a computer, uh, so she got good at it somehow. Um, and then she's really just incredibly street smart and great at lying her way into situations and lying her way out of situations and yeah. incredibly good at thinking on her feet, which is, right. is compelling. Um, the problem with it isn't so much I feel that like she wasn't fleshed out or not believable is that I actually liked her as a character. And oh, no, like, it wasn't her character that wasn't believable. I, I loved her character. I, yeah. It's like her, like near the end of the movie, you know, the flood is happening and she, the way she just reacts to that moment where it's like, oh, oh gosh, yeah. the toilet's overflowing. So she puts down the toilet seat, sits down on it and just starts smoking a cigarette. Right. And I was like, that moment was just, I cracked up so hard. It's like, oh, I it's, a, that's it's that struggle right there. It's I the literal, up. everything has gone to pot and she you just you the only thing you can do is just sit there and accept it that's all mm -hmm. that's the only option you have and it's a great visual metaphor for the poverty that the family has existed in and the situation they've gotten themselves into throughout the movie is right there what do you do because the dad talks about you know how the son has a plan and the sister is really good at scheming and he says i don't have a plan i uh, i react in the moment and that's a very big realization moment for the kids where they're like, you don't have any plan at all. Uh, and it explains so much about why they are where they are as well. So oh, it's, yeah. I really want to watch this movie now. It's so dang good. There's a, I yeah. generally, when a movie wins a bunch of Oscars, I'm always like, okay, it was political for some reason, but every now and again, it's deserved. And Parasite, yeah. Parasite it's, deserved uh, every Oscar. It's so interesting, though, is because, you know, you always, you watch most movies that are about class struggle and the characters that are supposed to be the most relatable are the people on the lower end. Yeah. But, I mean, are in the lower income and the poor people. Yet, they take this idea and turn them into the anti-hero, essentially. And you see the rich people, and these are genuinely nice people. You're trying to the entire and movie. And it, 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 it's just so interesting to see this dynamic. And it's, a, it's like you, you have this line from, from the mom that relates exactly why they did it the way they did it. The line from the mom is like, like why are we doing this? Because they're actually nice people. And she responds with like, they're rich enough. They're they're rich enough to be able to afford to be nice. We are not. This is yeah. why we are the way we are. It's like we can't. If we, it goes back to the the hierarchy of needs mm -hmm. that you. That's implied by. Uh, 
Maslow. You, you, you kind of implied it earlier. He's like, yeah. they're on the survival level. When you're on a survival level, you have to think about how do I get food? How do yeah. I stay? How do I keep my shelter? Things like that. And you can't really consider looking at the person across from you and seeing their eye to eye in their your humanity because hey they're in front they're what in my what is in my way yeah to eating food so the, the movie does something that is really rare and i think needs to be applauded it deals with universals without giving into stereotypes which is a really hard thing for any piece of medium to do because the the incentive is when you're making something that is talking about, especially something as hot button as class issues, um, is to have kind of straw men almost or, or yeah. heavies and creating cartoonish depictions of people that aren't people. Caricatures they're, of. Yeah, that. they're pure caricatures. And whenever like you have. A- the villain in Birds of Prey is a character, a pure caricature of a male misogynist. Like, the, yeah. he has no redeeming factor, and his only characterization is that essentially he hates women. And see, the it's, thing it's is, the you have to have a villain that you like, if you have to have a villain at all, because the whole question through Parasite is who's the villain? Is there one? Because everybody. It, I mean, the thing is that the very people that you're supposed to dislike, you're supposed to dislike the, the rich people. Like that's, it starts out in the beginning where as the one friend is getting the other friend into being able to teach English to these rich people's daughter is, oh yeah, the mom's an idiot. You know, the dad doesn't know what's going on. And so you immediately start creating these characters in your head before you see them. You say, okay, well, the mom's, more. well, actually, no, the mom's just kind of sweet and innocent and nice. And the dad's really the guy's really able and he does care about his family and loves them because nobody's the cartoon that we make them out to be in our heads. Mm -hmm. And you, when you stop treating people like human beings, you can't even have a good villain because (laughs) your villain has to be a human being. They have to have redeeming qualities because you have to have some amount of sorrow there for that person or that thing to be able to dislike them as much as you do. I know it sounds strange, you do. Uh, you really do. Yeah. Well, you you end up actually empathizing more with the rich people at the beginning than the poor and like the, your main characters. Right. And it's like, but yet he's able to take this turn on its head, and you see, like, it's a literal descent that they take down. When, each step. Yeah. Yeah. Each step. And it, 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 he symbolizes it so well when he's like, you have the rich people and it's pouring down rain and they're like, oh man, the only thing they have to worry about is getting home because their camping night was ruined and their son's birthday party is ruined. And the, the poor family is thinking, oh gosh, did we close our window? Because they're up on the high ground, the poor are on the low ground. So you see this literal descent as it's pouring down rain, and they're walking further and further and getting deeper and deeper in the water, and they get to the house, and their house is completely submerged at that mm-hmm. point because it's actually below the level that uh, even the street is at. Yeah. So it, it's an interesting visual metaphor that you see in that descent. And then you realize why they are the way they are. Yeah. It's because their, their survival, the rain did not affect the rich family. The rain destroyed their ability to live. And you see these small things that when you're in certain places in life, the smallest thing can be the destruction of your entire way of life. And yet, the movie still doesn't give into either this idea of making the poor family into being these perfect, wonderful people that you completely think, oh, you know, these poor people have just had every bad hand handed to them. They still make scummy, terrible decisions. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then you, you can't hate these rich people like, oh yeah, they just got rich off the backs of other people. Now they've actually done all they can to really try to help others 
as much as they're able to, and they've done nothing to offend anybody. You know, nothing is their fault either. So it's an incredible tightrope act that the movie walks that it doesn't force you to think these people are this way and these people are this way. Because a great movie doesn't, any great anything, doesn't tell you how to think about something. It presents things to you and allows you to come to your own conclusions. Because it wants a great piece of literature, a great piece of art, a great game, a great movie. It wants to pull out of you what you already believe and says, does this conform with that? Mm-hmm. Here's, here's a thing. This is how people yeah, actually act. You get it. to choose how you respond to this. Mm-hmm. Which is, I mean, because it really makes you think, oh, crap, how have I been treating other people today, poor or otherwise, or wretch? Yeah. Or, you know, it's, it doesn't say, oh, rich, bad, poor, good, or poor, bad, rich, good. It's not about that because it's about people. It's not about where they are that makes them good or bad, you know, uh, that they all made bad and dumb decisions because they're human beings, because this is a story about human beings. Um, so it's a brilliant, brilliant movie and i'm glad i got challenged to it um and i'm also always glad to talk about uh tearing down stupid caricatures in literature and art too <laughs> how because... much you loved it like i it's so funny like sorry but like i know you do tend to be a little contrarian and you do tend to be quite you know sometimes uh yeah. hard on some of the things that you're challenged to and like it's funny yeah. to see how much you adored this film. i did I and, really you know, watch it now. There's, I mean, a couple of things I think are flaws, and I can't really fault the decision of the filmmaker. Uh, you know, it's it, it's his story to tell. Um, you know, the sister dies in it, and that's how it goes. Um, that's how the story goes, and that may be even part of what I'm supposed to accept as a viewer, because the whole thing is about me trying to accept what's happening, uh, because these are people, and not just cartoon characters. I'm- so. I'm kind of curious, like, I, I'm interested to watch it. I'm kind of curious if I feel like the, maybe the decision was made to kill a character that you didn't, that, yeah. that wasn't the character that you would have wanted to die. Right. I don't know. Right. Like, and that's, gonna... that's life. You know, that's, that's life. But life. sometimes the, the person that you think is the most promising and is the one that should be the one to get the most rewards and most success is the one that does not. I mean, it's the whole point of the story. So maybe that's, you know, a microcosm of it right there with the sister dying. I don't know. Um, I've tried to analyze it as much as I can because, uh, you know, I'm trying to actually with this one, sometimes I like to go and read analyses of a movie and try to see what people have dug up on it and read what the pe- people intended. I didn't do that with Parasite. I wanted to get my impression of it and leave it at that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, speaking even, of... Go ahead. I was going to say, we, we didn't even touch on like other brilliant aspects on the film. We could just... Yeah go quickly over oh, gosh. but it, it's a, the movie is genuinely a funny movie particularly yes. at the beginning of the movie it it, it 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 keeps a consistent level of comedy throughout it's like it's a very sardonic film in many ways it then like not only do they does he have the comedy he, when he trans transitions over to more of the drama it mm-hmm. creates this excellent like like i haven't had that much tension when you first discover what is actually going on Uh uh-huh i haven't had that much tension since i saw one two three and a glorious bastard yeah oh yeah yeah (laughs) it's like Uh, which is something you get to go back and see and see the characters in the background react to um and there there there's so many moments like that where a moment that is initially humorous becomes very ominous upon a repeated viewing like when the mom is saying yes i I, my son saw a ghost and the mom's just you know the other mom's like okay i I guess and it's a very humorous moment at the time and then when you find out what the ghost is oh no it's not humorous at all it's actually ludicrously dark uh And there are these, and it's not. There's no bathos in the movie where you have a serious moment and then a light moment that just kind of undercuts the seriousness of what just happened. Like what is the entirety of uh, the Star Wars Episode Eight, Last Jedi? You have these moments 
that are humorous, but they're humorous because the characters are doing something humorous or they're, they would themselves find it humorous. It's not something externally applied. I never feel like there's the hand of the director like doing these moments that are specifically for my benefit as the viewer. That crap takes me out of an ex- a viewing experience so quickly when, okay, the only reason these lines are crafted this way is because somebody would be looking at them saying these things. Mm-hmm. When you do that, you're a lazy screenwriter. Don't do that. Do things right. that people would say. Humans. Like the people in Parasite, which is a brilliant movie that I will extol the virtues of for the rest of my natural life. Um, all right, I could talk oh, about Parasite. We could talk about Parasite for hours. Is there anything else that you want to mention about the movie? Because I do want to get to, to Sydney's movie because as long as we're sticking mm-hmm. on the subtitled foreign film thing. Exactly. Sounds good. Well, Sydney, what? Did, okay. Full disclosure, in case people watched the previous episode where we did mention what the discomfort zone was going to be this week, uh, and we did mention the movie Borat. You know, you're the editor. You could have just cut that. Like, I did. The problem is that episode's already up online. So what are you going to do? Um, that was before we... Well, it was before... I'm not going to remove the old episode. It was before we realized that it was actually getting a copy of Borat was like next to impossible. During and a pandemic. During a pandemic. So we're we kind of going with... money on it? Yeah, exactly. We were not going to spend money on this movie. <laughs> Which is fair. And it was kind of a, a little bit of a birthday gift to Sydney of not making her watch Borat. Um, but there's another movie that you didn't, that you really didn't care for that you were like, okay, well, you know what, since it's getting a copy of Borat is just seemingly next to impossible. Here is a movie that I actually don't like that would be worth talking about. And that movie is. So the movie is Amelie yeah. and I have a little bit of a history with this movie. So let me explain how this came about. I was challenged to this movie and Paul tried to give me a free pass on Borat, which at first I turned down. I was like, no, I don't want to do that. And then I was like, right. you know what? This is not working out. It's just bad. It was a comedy of errors trying to get me to watch this movie. And then I couldn't find it when I tried to watch it. Um, so the thing is, I, I have some history with this film and I have two uh, friends slash family members who both watch the podcast and have seen what we're doing and are like, I know what I want to challenge you to. (laughs) And they literally both challenged me to watch Amelie again because they knew I hated it. Mm -hmm. And both of them were like, what? The best challenges are the ones that, you know, aren't coming from us, you know. They are. Family members or or in the comment section, you know. So they both knew I hated this movie. And when they found out, they were like, what? because they both love this movie. I'm like, no, it's a terrible movie. Like I had to watch it like literally years ago. I'm not gonna date myself. Years ago when I was doing my film minor in college, I had to watch all. And a friend of mine was so stunned by this that she was like, I need to know how you hate this movie. And I'm going through like my memories of it. I was like, oh, it was terrible. I had to watch it for an assignment. I had to like, write this paper on it the next day and like it's this french foreign film and i don't get it and like she's like i want you to watch this movie again and then she she's seen the body she's like in fact i challenge you to watch this movie again so it was something we'd set off in the past or in the and into the future and then when i nixed borat they were like okay then you have to watch amelie she's like okay i'll watch amelie So luckily my cousin had a copy of it. She's like, come by, you can get my copy and watch it. Ironically enough, it then came up for free on like some streaming channel, like two days later. Of course. But anyway, because of course I couldn't find it and then it was available. Um, So I sat down and rewatched this movie. And once again, I, I have an interesting, um, there's an interesting twist to, to, coming to this movie a second time because despite being challenged to it jokingly I did have a conversation with both of them about the movie um and it was weird because hearing my friend Sarah talk about it I was like oh my god like you're making me want to watch this film that I know that I hated (laughs) and the way she is describing it she's like no it's like this beautiful little like story of just like I'm like this is not the movie that I remember watching. I remember like this strange, artsy, 
French film. Right. Apparently I missed something. And I did. And what I came to about this movie is, and this is going to be a controversial thing to say here where we're challenging each other two things. But I have to say that like, in coming to this movie a second time, I feel like there are some things that don't need to be forced upon you. And this is a prime example of that. I feel like I watched this movie the wrong way. I was probably 19 years old, um, which has no bearing on this, but I was 19 years old doing my minor in film. It was an assignment. It was a subtitled foreign film in French, which like, this is not a like, don't take this the wrong way. If you speak French or are French, this is nothing against French. Right. French is one of the languages that I struggle to listen to. Mm. I will try and explain this. I am not a linguistics expert by any stretch of the imagination. For some reason, I watch a lot of films in Italian. I watch a lot of films in Danish. I watch a lot of films in Swedish. Um, I watch some films in Spanish. French is one of those languages that I have never been able to latch onto the cadence of. Mm. They speak in a very specific manner. And I do not understand the cadence of the sentence structure. So while listening in Italian, which I have some vague familiarity with and do understand a little of, and by extension Spanish, um, I'm by no means fluent in either of these languages. I just understand enough to get by. Right. And because of that, I understand like how the sentence structure flows. I can hear it. I know where sentences break. I know where paragraphs break. I don't get that with French. I don't yeah. like think French. French is very difficult for me. <laughs> Watching this movie again, honestly, going back to our conversation about subtitles, I wish I understood French. Mm. Um, I came to this movie very differently knowing what I thought of it the first time and having had conversations about the film and how delightful friends of mine who I respect the opinions of found it. Right. I took, I actually took three days to watch the movie because I did get interrupted a few times. And because it's subtitled, you can't get interrupted. Um, you have to sit and watch the movie, which is very clear for me. <laughs> um, but I actually like took evenings sat on the couch, made, you know, coffee or whatever, tea, like, you know, poured a drink and just like, okay, this is what we're doing right now. We're watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's an act of discipline for me, if you know me. Um, but it was, it was strange because the experience that I had with it this time was very different because this time I found this film delightful. Hmm. And the only thing that I can say is, A, I don't think assigning it to a film student was the right way to come to it, number mm. one. And also I was in a very different place in my life where I was like on a right. mission in every minute of my day. And so this story that is really about this girl who grew up very isolated and just has this insane imagination. Right. And that's why it's very artsy. It's, it's, it's shown from her perspective. So the colors are very bright. The way she sees the world is very different and unique. And for someone where I was when I watched this movie the first time, I, was, I found that very unrelatable. And this movie is so much about simple joys and simple pleasures that you find every day. It's not about some big extravagant goal. And really like in that is, it's very much built in the culture that made the movie. Um, I feel like I see things in this film that I see, I've seen in a, the few other French films that I've watched. It's very focused on those kind of little moments that really make your day great, right. even though we don't pay much attention to them. And it calls so much attention to them that if you come to this movie open to that, which I did not the first go right. round, it's delightful. This is so French. It's, it's totally a French very, concept. It's a very French movie. It's a very French movie conceptually. You know what the, uh, this kind of reminds me of? Because like you were saying, you, it's a movie that you can't be forced into. It, like I had a very similar experience with uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, Harper mm -hmm. Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird. The first time I read that book, I had to read it for school. Mm -hmm. I ended up hating the book. I've read that book four times now, and each time I've read it, I've 
liked it and loved it even more. Mm -hmm. So it, it's kind of interesting to see that. And, and I had a, you go can go from hating something to loving something. I, I want to hear Paul's comment, and then I'm going to expound well, on what Jeremy said. Because I had a, a, a very similar experience. It wasn't something I was forced to see, but seeing something in the wrong context can absolutely destroy how much you love something, and that was The Dark Knight, which the first time I saw it, I hated it. Mm -hmm. I saw it in the theater, and apparently everyone else in the theater were a bunch of sociopaths because they're laughing at the Joker's antics. I'm like, he just shoved a pencil into that man's brain. I think that's supposed to be horrific. So the experience of being around, and like when he blows at the hospital, I'm like, People died there. Innocent people. It's not funny. People are just a bunch of dicks. Like just theater of dicks. That's all this is. So that was my experience with seeing Dark Knight. So I didn't like the movie. And plus the whole thing of, you know, at the end where Batman says, maybe it's better if they believe a lie. I'm like, no, it's not. It's objectively not. It never has worked in the history of ever that believing in a lie is better for humanity because ultimately everyone finds out whether the guy was a scumbag or not. So not in the Plato's the noble lie. No, not at all. L look, there's a lot that Plato and Aristotle and the great Greek philosophers thought they're impressive people, but they got a lot of stuff wrong. Sorry. And don't try the Socratic method on the baby, by the way, it doesn't work. So the seeing the dark night, yeah in the theater, ruined me for it. And then, years later, um, just before uh, Dark Knight Rises was coming out, I wanted to kind of do that thing that we all do when we're nerds or something, where we want to watch all the stuff before we go see the new thing. Like, you got to see all the Star Wars movies before you go see the Star Wars, or you got to see all the Marvel movies, or Lord of the Rings, or whatever. So, I was doing that with, uh, with Dark Knight Rises. Okay, I'm going to watch Batman Begins, and then I'm going to watch Dark Knight. And I watched it by myself, and I loved it. Because at this point, I could take it in all with my own emotions and my own reactions and take in just how horrible the Joker, what a juxtaposition he's supposed to be. Because the juxtaposition of the Joker is that he is somebody who's outwardly trying to be humorous and scary at the same time and pulls it off. And that's supposed to be really unsettling. It's not a funny thing. It's an unsettling thing strange uncomfortable thing and i loved the movie then because i was able to see it with my own reactions um so context matters a lot whether whether movie's good for you or not it does and and honestly it's it's kind of spun some other conversations for me because of course after i watched it of course they were both clamoring to know what i thought and right. i had to go back to my my two people and admit like i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> I hate do I hate doing that with art. I hate like um, oh it was good. I actually didn't hate it. I was so glad I was wrong. Um, oh good, good, I good. Was so glad to be wrong about this movie because like, I mean, I viscerally hated this movie the first time I watched it. I right, like, right. Why am I watching this kind of thing? Um, he uh, hello. Well, let's uh, say I hate it. I mean, I hate it. Like I hate missing something cool. Like I, I hate my initial reaction to it. Like gosh darn, I have to admit I was wrong about this. You know, so I missed a cool thing up until this point. You know, it's but frustrating. The, the, the conversations that it's fun out, I love that Jeremy brought up To Kill a Mockingbird, actually, because mm -hmm. um, not that specifically, but like yeah. the way that it happened for you, because I, I kind of went on a, on a hard discussion about like, look, I'm, I'll leave my issues with my experience with education out of tonight's overall discussion. However, in the context of this, like, because I could go on for eight hours, Jeremy. <laughs> like, <laughs> I could do. We've talked don't worry about this. Since. Um, but in context of this, we got into it. We, me and my friend who challenged me to watch it, Sarah, got into a discussion about um a book that she had to read, and I'm like, you know, isn't it terrible the way we come to these things because it's so strong-armed and it's so forced it ruins it before you ever have a chance to enjoy or understand it and look i look i'm all for educating people i'm not saying like obviously like, kids are just good but, but like <laughs> i i wish there was a better idea of a method then you must watch this thing or you must read this thing and then you must come back yeah. and tell me your thoughts on it in a five paragraph format like 
Because even by saying, oh, go watch this movie and tell me what you think, you've already made it an assignment, which yeah. is not the way you can come to this specific movie. I do, I do not believe you can come to this specific film this way. Mm -hmm. If you come to Amelie with, I have to write a paper to <laughs> tell an instructor what I think about this, you're already like trying to precognate what your thoughts are. Right. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a, for for something in it and it's really not a story you can be doing that with. I just don't feel like it's the way to come to that film. Right. And there are so many things that I think are ruined for us by this. Even if it's not to that level, there are so many books that I read that, oh, I hate that because I was forced to read it and I didn't have time or the position to form an opinion on it correctly. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that, I don't know what the answer is. I don't have an answer. Because like, I have a movie I, like I'm thinking of right now that I absolutely adore. But you know, if I were to would have been forced to watch this movie, I probably would have hated it because there's a lot of little dumb things throughout the movie that could have ruined it for me and taken away the charm of it. And that that would be Moonrise Kingdom, which is my one of my favorite movies by um uh wes anderson? Anderson. yeah by wes anderson so it's like just yeah. make it the way you're describing the movie just made me think of uh moonrise king so. yeah and I, I and i haven't seen it but like i i, I feel like i get where you're coming from because i've seen the trailers and i kind of know a little bit about it so like i and i feel like especially with things that are like so quintessentially like wrapped up in life and emotion and like just the, the situation of humans. And especially when like for, for this specifically with the film Amelie, I, look, I fully understand as a film class instructor, you're like, oh, I should expose my students to foreign films. <laughs> but when you're coming as an American student in college, at that specific age, trying to gun to get into a film school or whatever you're trying to do in life. Right, right. It's a very, very foreign con. It's, it's, it's a concept that's so foreign, you're not open to it at all. I wasn't. Yeah, that's the problem. Assigning, assigning entertainment. It's a really, really tough thing. It's not like a math problem where you can just – tell somebody to power through it or there's a, a specific answer entertainment whether it's literature or whether it's movies and plus it's so personal like math isn't personal mm -hmm. math doesn't care whether you think two plus two equals five or if you actually believe that it's two plus two equals four it doesn't care but with film like who, who also who decided the classics we had to read like i remember reading uh, wow. The Grapes of Wrath in high school. And there's nothing about that book that speaks to a reasonably well-off 20th century, late 20th century, early 21st century teenager. I'm sorry. Th this is about the Dust Bowl and about people starving to death. Mm -hmm. And the, the rampant, terrible uh, uh, desolation that I was facing these people. I in Oklahoma. Like there's, a, there's an issue with, because like, okay, so I will speak from my school experience for a second. So my school reading list was l like objectively terrible. Like wow. I didn't read the classics. Let me explain to you, like the books that I remember reading, probably the most formidable of them, which I hated was The Giver. Um, hated the book is probably the most formidable thing I was assigned. Other highlights include Island of the Blue Dolphins. And I know what you did last summer, which I read in one night in my bathroom. So it was a terrible, like, really quick read. That was a book? I didn't it's even know book. that was a book. It is a book. That was a, wait, was it a novelized? A was that movie based in a no, book? That movie was based on a book. What? No one knows okay. that but me. Like, okay. Okay. I'll give you one however, real fast. As long as we're doing this. No. Did you know, did you know Die Hard was based on a book? Yes, I did, actually. Um, okay, good. I did because he filmed me. Okay, but fair enough. All right. I, I do I say this to make a point that like I yeah. didn't read the Count of Monte Cristo. I didn't read the Grapes right. of Wrath. I did not get assigned the classics, which was weird because there were other kids in my school reading those books. 
I don't know what happened with my class in English. But I say all this to say that yes, who decided, but also, look, I understand there was a, there was an idea here that like humans as we are educated should be exposed to certain things. I get that. I understand right. it. We are going about it incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I, I can objectively say, I think at this point that we were going about it incorrectly because whether you got my nine reading list or you read the grapes of wrath and we're like, this does not say it doesn't speak to me because I have no basis for understanding this. Just like I had no connection to understand Amelie when it was assigned to me. Right. That there's got to be, I hate to say it a better way. And I know it sounds inane to have this conversation, on a show where we challenge each other to do things and experience things that we don't want to watch and or do or experience. Right. However, there, there's, okay, I want to make a distinction because I was thinking a lot about that. Right. When I decided to rewatch Amelie. I feel like, but like, A, okay, let's be real. This is all in good fun. You did let me out of Borat. Thank you. <laughs> I, Trust me. I felt bad challenging you to that so we'll just don't do that anymore like push borat over here and just forget it exists i'll, I'll I mean, just challenge you to borat every week and you'll just say no every week mother. Do it every week <laughs> from we now on um but once again like a at the end of the day this all is and this is mostly all in good fun yes yeah. we want to talk to each other a little bit but it's all in good fun i think generally speaking with the exception of paul no <laughs> generally speaking we challenge each other to things that we think we'll actually get something out of yeah. or that we think will create a good discussion, which was legitimately my issue with Borat is like, I just didn't feel like I had that much to speak on. Once I like dug into it a little bit, I'm like, I, yeah. I can't have a conversation about this movie. Um, That's fair. That is intelligent and meaningful. And I, I think there's something to coming to it. Like, I, okay, I don't know what I've gotten myself into here but I will experience it and we will see if we can find some meaning here. Mm -hmm. But once again, we're coming from to coming at it from a very different place than a student in fifth or seventh or eighth grade being assigned a book that they're like, I don't know why you're telling me to read this crap. Yeah. And that's tough. It, it is. I don't, once again, I don't know what the answer is to this, well, but I feel like there has got to be a better way to expose without putting an expectation on well i think something that <clears throat> that people need to stop disliking is reading cliff notes or synopses on wikipedia because i am fine knowing about the grapes of wrath mm -hmm. i don't feel that there's a need for me to have digested john steinbeck's ode to misery that was the grapes of wrath which is what it is when you read it it's just like you think things are bad now? They're going to get a lot worse until it says the end. It just gets worse. So, Is that 2020? Say what? Is that 2020? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is, it is 2020 distilled in a paperback. And the thing is that there were books that I was assigned to read throughout the years that I loved. Like I was, you know, I had to read Frankenstein. I had to read Range Roy's Dream of Electric Sheep. And then there were books that I never, that I found out were on. I know. I love my reading list. I know. Trust all the sci-fi stuff. And it, I, years later, when I finally read Ender's Game as an adult, and I saw that that was like on some kid's reading list. I'm like, what lucky kids got to read one of the great sci-fi epics uh, mm -hmm. of all uh, the great hugo award-winning like as a kid i was like reading like ring world and all the sci-fi uh short story stuff that you my still dad got a way better list than me no i got a lot of know. ray bradbury and stuff like Fahrenheit yes. 451 i got george orwell 1984 animal farm yeah. i did not know i had to read those on my own <laughs> i read those on my own i didn't get assigned to those i read I those to, as like, an adult <laughs> yeah I, I, and, and, uh, 20,000 leagues into the sea, we got assigned no Jules Verne. I'm like, you want to talk about literary classics? Let's talk about interesting sci-fi. Like I had to read war of the worlds as an adult. Like that uh -huh. should have been assigned. Like yeah. these, these are great stories. And what's great about HG Wells. 
thankfully I got a Nashi Wells in like uh, seventh grade. So <laughs> that's cool. I love the War of the Worlds, but it was written as a series of short stories, and there are some characters that he just kind of forgets to bring back up. So you just kind of assume they died. I love I love that book. Though. Fair assumption. Fair assumption. But uh, but yeah, getting challenged and you know sticking on the theme of of talking about Amelie and getting having to take in something as a teenager. Uh, when you're when you're forced to do it for an assignment for something like that, and you have to take it so seriously, as opposed to you know you're going to get a fun discussion out of it, it's it does cast a pall on the whole thing. Um, sure. And when you're forced, it's forced whimsy. Like that's the problem with Amelie. Like as a movie that you're forced to watch, it's but forced it's whimsy. So it's like I, and it's eat so- this Big Mac. Like oh I don't okay <laughs> all right. My senior year of high school, we got assigned a series of books, and we had to do group projects on these books, and it was like a big chunk of our grade. But the way the, the teacher stylized the thing is, it was like, this group did this one book, and another group did a different book, and we all read every single one of those books. So there was no obligation to like do the uh we we didn't have to do the hard work on all all the books just one of the books and it ended up freeing us and made the experience so much more pleasurable and i ended up loving all the books that we read we we read sense and sensibility we read the plague by albert camus we read oh, uh, my cousin my, my, read the plague <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, it's funny. It's like the plague is an incredibly dry doc. This it takes place is like almost like journal entries from a doctor. Yeah, right. it's very dry. But yet, I got to experience it in a way where it was a lot less. Oh, I have to read this and do this really large project on it because mm-hmm. all I had to do was focus on my book, which was the Heart of Darkness. Right. And it was a much more pleasurable experience. So I'm wondering if that's like. I think that um, that's the key. How do you free, like you said it was much more freeing. Like yeah. how do you free up that experience? Like once again, obviously we have to educate humans. However, right. like I feel like it, it does, it casts so much shadow over these things that really are great. Like, look, I love Lord of the Rings, the books, not the movies. I, I do love the movies, but I love the books. I would not force anyone to read Lord of the Rings. It is a dry. That's, Tolkien, that's hard. It's like something you must love Tolkien to read these. Yeah, books. like the Hobbit and, is such a breeze, and it just does not prime you for the Lord of the Rings at all. See, like I, like I went all the way back. Like I read the Silmarillion, so like I. Oh, like, yeah, that's like reading the dictionary. Uh, it is <laughs> like reading a history book of a world that doesn't exist. <laughs> like, yeah. It's yeah. Strange. It's a very dry read. It is not. It's not an enjoyable, easy read. I will go on record for saying, like, I've read all of Thomas Harris's books, the Hannibal series. Far easier reading, okay, about a much darker subject matter. Oh, oh, yes. Uh, You can read through those books. Tolkien is dry. And that being said, I wouldn't force anybody to read Tolkien. But when you come to Tolkien... With, like, I just want to know, like, as I did, like, as a teenager, which was, I just want to know more about Middle Earth. <laughs> right, right, right. It becomes fun. And yeah. nobody forced me to do that. So I, re- I read my way through these gigantic dictionaries of books. And yeah. how do you create that emotion in well, a setting? There, there are a couple of things you can do. And one thing that helps out with history is tell the stories that are actually interesting, like the fact that after the inauguration of uh, George Washington, the city got hammered, and George Washington himself had, like, he and the other founding fathers had thousands upon thousands of then dollars of alcohol, like, a hundred bottles of wine, 40 40 bottles of whiskey, between, like, eight guys, you know, and the whole thing was just this drunken reverie. And you have things like uh, um, Andrew Jackson, where an assassin wanted to kill him, pulls out a revolver, it misfires, pulls out another gun, it misfires. And then Andrew Jackson nearly beats the man to death with his cane. Like, 
these are the stories we didn't get told. And I think another thing is you kind of use like the, um, you know, the danger aspects of things. Like when I was in high school, I read just because I wanted to, I read Clockwork Orange. Um, yeah. And like, it's a weird, disturbing book. Um, and I think that I, I actually tried watching the movie later on and I'm like, nope, can't do it. It's, a, I, it's, it's too dark for me seeing that stuff. Uh, and they even toned down the movie yeah. um, versus some of the things that are in the book. Um, plus, they cut off the ending where he actually does eventually reform, uh, which really frustrates me that they cut that ending from the book that was really, I think, a necessary thing for his character. Um, mm -hmm. But it was part of the, the kind of danger. Like, you know, you, like I had friends who were like, interested in reading Stephen King and, I, and Wes Craven, uh, not Wes Craven, uh, Clive Barker. Um, I loved Clive Barker's short stories, uh, Roald Dahl's weird short stories that he wrote. Yeah, it was the thing of finding that camaraderie with people because I think a lot of this stuff comes from your peer group of what they find cool. It's the part of the thing of like the whole thing of like, why doesn't anti-smoking education work? You know, we're telling people it's bad for them. It's like, well, the problem is they're people that they think are cool that are smoking. And that's all they need to know. And it's how do you make something cool and palatable and fun for people who are in a completely different age from you. Like a 16 year old is not going to listen to me well, I, about what's cool, I, you know, or what they should learn. Like what I, so I had very minimal interest in history until I was an adult um, because of the way that history was taught to me, yeah. um, which was not the interesting version. Like I learned there are so many interesting things later that no one told me in school. Uh -huh. Um, and like, and I'll use this as an example, like this is not the only thing, but like one of my favorite examples is this is what I loved about the early Assassin's Creed games. Not because they're super historically accurate. Like, so don't like read me on that. No, no, no. Because no. they open you up to details about things and they throw in little nuggets that you're like, wait a second, that's really mm -hmm. interesting. And then you become, you start to feel connected to places and people. And right. I want to know more. Like, look, no one was as excited as me when Netflix came out with Medici. Like, I was like, <laughs> on, like white on rice. I like. I think there are people in Italy who were not as excited as right. me. And which, all, like, I knew nothing about that because I was not taught that during my Renaissance history class. Like, I mm -hmm. briefly got the names of Leonardo da Vinci and you know. Uh, Botticelli and whoever else who I love, I, like I have a list. Of, it's not, Gosh. I don't know, I just, I'm not going to get into it. Um, Raphael and Michelangelo right. and I mean, yeah, obviously the turtles, but you know, <laughs> don't, Titian and you know, great. It's not a turtle ball. No. Um, but my point is that like, it wasn't until like I got exposed in that way to Renaissance history that I was like, Oh my God, there, there's this whole like swath of interesting stories about real humans that are relatable yeah that like a look i there's a whole shelf on my bookshelf in the other room devoted to just the borgias the medici family like all of these renaissance figures that like if you had introduced me to that stuff as like a teenager i would have been like this is fascinating everyone's trying to kill each yes. other and yes like, Oh, and the comp the the competitions like with gardens, like the size of your garden was a, a part of your your stature, and they would compete with each other. Like I had the bigger garden, they would bring people over. Let's have a party in my garden. It's much bigger than your garden, Cardinal. What's your name? Funny. It's like the way that like I know this is a tangent from what we're actually supposed to be talking about, but like the way they teach history is they take major moments, but give none of the background to the major moments and no, why they're okay. important. And it's like, you, you get like, we learn about the battle of Midway, but what made Midway important? It's like, oh, that was the first major naval battle that we won. And we wiped out four aircraft carriers and they had five total. Japan had five aircraft yeah. carriers total at that time. So it's like, that That's was when, like, it's like, and it's like, they're, they're, and you don't learn of any of the politicking behind the scene of you know MacArthur versus King, the the admiral, like these huge personalities that are constantly butting heads, mm -hmm. and, and and it's a fascinating thing that we just never get in school because they teach us 
just the big right. moments are yeah. actually yeah. which are actually some of the least important parts. And the thing it's is, it's important to know what the date is, but why why midway matters. But that's not the why, end, Jeremy. And I'll I'll tell you why. Because like the the important thing behind all of this is that context matters. Yes, it does. <laughs> exactly. It makes matters. you care. But this is the thing, it makes you care. Like you talk about Botticelli, like then when you hear, and this is probably about 15 years ago when there was a massive earthquake in Italy and destroyed some Botticelli frescoes, uh, it, it hits you. It makes you care about things. When World War II veterans pass away and your heroes go, it hits you and it makes you care about these things when you learn the why. You know, this is the thing that it, when we are fo so focused on what, and we Gosh, everything, everything can go back to the Simon Sinek why a business TED talk. Uh, literally every conversation can go back to that because getting to the why of something is so much more interesting than the what. And we learn so much what in school and we don't learn why. The history that you learn in school is boring because it's all what. They don't teach you why. You know, we're going to learn about the founding of our country. Why? Because you need to learn it. Okay, well, that's not really a reason not to a make. Good that's not a good answer. That's not a good answer. Let's learn about 1776. Let's learn about the Declaration of Independence. Like, you know, teach interesting things like the War of 1812. Like, we need to think about the fact that we had another war with Britain like 40 years after the first one. We kind of need to remember these things. Like, this is important stuff. And we don't. Who here, who here read John Locke before you left high school? No. None of us. No. Really. No. Of course not. Nobody's going to read Thomas Paine or Tom Law. Nobody's going to read these things just, just because for enough. fun. I had to read the Communist Manifesto, but I never had to read Common Sense. It's kind of <laughs> interesting observation. Dang. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's like a, you know, and the thing is, we, we, we have this thing of, uh, I think, dissuading some learning. Like, uh, I have a cousin who has read more books than I knew existed. Like he, he thinks that the unabridged Les Miserables, which is a cube of paper of 1500 pages is just far more interesting. Like the, he can't see any abridged version. Like I have never read a 1500 page book and then a thousand page book enough times to compare back to back. And he's done that. And he read Mein Kampf and talked about how interesting it was. And like, he's not Man, interested in Nazism at all, but, it's just because he wants to know the history. He just wants to know things. And this is the thing is that we dissuade certain kinds of learning and we dissuade certain kinds of interest. And I think that when we do that, it's kind of like telling somebody not to smoke. Well, why shouldn't I smoke? Well, you just shouldn't. Okay, well, now I'm interested in finding out why you're telling me to not smoke. It's the whole thing when you dissuade certain kinds of learning, you say you shouldn't learn that. I, I had a German teacher who was brilliant. Uh, she talked about one of her classes one year's they bugged her so much to teach her all the swear words in German that she did. And she said, I am not only going to teach you the swear words, I'm going to test you on them at the end of the year. And you're going to know each of them and the proper grammatical use of each of them. And like, those kids knew German <laughs> those really kids well. They learned German. They learned those German. Those kids learn German. You know, when you learn Scheisse and you know how to use it properly, you're going to remember it. And it's fantastic. But the thing about it is, is that, and I say all this to say that, like, that, that this whole topic really ruined this movie for me the first yeah. time. And I'm so glad that somebody told me, like, you're an idiot. Go back and watch it. Like, you're wrong. You're missing the point. Because I was entirely missing the point of this, right. like, delightful little film. That, like, yeah. in the grand scheme of things, is it is it a, a huge message? Is it anything? No. It's just, like, this is life. And there is beauty in it. And Right. One of my favorite moments is, I don't know if, if, how familiar either of you are with the movie, um, but like there's a moment where she's like leading this trail of breadcrumbs to get this guy to meet with her because she's found his photo album. And she puts a photo together and she's like, do you want to meet me? And the message is in the photo. She's torn it up, put it underneath a photo booth and he doesn't show up on time. And she has two thoughts. And because she is like this isolated, lonely little child. Right. And her imagination just runs rampant. Oh, 
She has these two thoughts. And one is that he didn't get the photo because like somebody swept it up and it like got blown away. The other is that like he's kidnapped and ends up like stealing warheads in Russia. (laughs) (laughs) And he ends up somehow loses his memory and he's in Pakistan. And like that's wonderful. Goes on this whole trail for like a literal like three minutes of just like the story that she's concocted that might be true. (laughs) Right, right. Oh, that's wonderful. It's just a delightful little film, and it shows these these beautiful little moments in the lives of all the people around her. And I think that's part of why we're doing this, is to kind of dissuade us of some notions. Like, I went into, into Parasite with some preconceived notions that were completely wrong. Mm-hmm. You know, I was thinking it was going to be much more... I, somebody mentioned to me that it was like horror or something. There were horror elements, and I'm like, okay, great. It's just going to be un- uncomfortable and scary. And it was none of that. You know, you go into things with preconceived notions or you latch onto something because you're in a certain place in life and you get these ideas about something and we have to dissuade ourselves of those things. We have to get rid of those dumb things. Um, so, Jeremy, what foreign film did you have to watch this week? What subtitled? Well, I had to watch The Brotherhood of the Wolves, another French. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love that It was movie. Babette's Feast. It was amazing. Uh... <laughs> but... Um... So this did I week, challenge you to, Jeremy? What did you get challenged to? You challenged me to my favorite thing in the world. You know, got the hip hop music. Is it really hip hop? No, it's more club music. But Pitbull. 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 Not the dog. No. This, this generation's greatest poet, so, our so Robert we're, Frost. We we were, we were just uh, Mr. Worldwide. You know. Um, a funny thing about about this, because like we were just talking about preconceived notions, and my my familiar familiarity with uh, Pitbull before actually diving into some of his music was a skit that uh, <laughs> Comedy Central put together. Which you where, shared with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I totally shared that with you. Like this was this was what I knew about Pitbull was he was sitting down, you know, at a bar with his entourage behind him. And he's like, hey, you want to take a picture with me? And the girls come over, yeah, and they take a picture. Then it's like the, the bartender walks over and he's like, hey, you want to take a picture with me? He's like, no. He's like, why not? Because you're a douchebag. <laughs> it just like crashes his entire world world and he just goes back and he's like he has this self-identity crisis throughout this thing it's brilliant i still think it's absolutely hilarious but you know i that preconceived notion isn't like what actually he is like because it tried to make the point that like every single song of his sounds the same and People still like Motorhead. Yeah, like, like, yeah, it's like there's a there's a club element to all his music. You know, it's it's made to be danced to, and he also has this Latin flair to it. So you know, you, Latin club music, you have reggaeton. So you're gonna have throughout most of his songs, you're gonna have that. It's like you have that reggaeton element behind it, right? But, um. Uh, there's something interesting he he does, and ultimately it's like I'm conflicted because his early stuff, a lot of his early stuff, I I see exactly what they're talking about. A lot of it is just it feels very samey. Like every song could almost just blend into each other. But right. later, later on, he started collaborating with other artists. He's like, he's collaborated with everyone. He's like Kesha. He's done Chris Brown. He's done so many different people, and it adds this whole other flair to it. It's like, but I, I got lucky that my first exposure to his music, that knowing this is a Pitbull song, because later on there. I ended up hearing some songs that, like, oh, I didn't know this was Pitbull. Oh, but right, right. the first song that I listened to was a song called Three to Tango. And what what was interesting about the song is, like, 
there's a piano going throughout the song that is in a tango rhythm. But underneath the tango, you still have this reggaeton element. So you have the tango rhythm, which is uh, Afro-Cuban style music. And then you have a Puerto Rican style music underneath it, which is the club element. And so you have this extremely danceable, fun song with a lot of actually very complex elements at its heart. And it's like, a lot of people call his music shallow. And I listen to that and like, that isn't shallow. There was a lot of thought put behind it. Then later on, I like, a lot, I, I started hearing some of his earlier songs in, um, what was it? Uh, I, I can't think of any of the specific song titles that were some of those earlier things because it all did just blend together. It was very shallow. It was basically you have your reggaeton beat with a sandstone top. Mm -hmm. And then you have some uh, lyric that just repeats itself through a lot of the songs. So it's like, I, I, I understand the initial criticism. Mm -hmm. But he branched out majorly after, like, after he got really big, after he started, instead of calling himself Mr. Uh, whatever, the area code, with 305? 305. Yeah. He went Mr. Worldwide. After he became Mr. Worldwide, like, his library of music got much it more It kind of opens up and goes all over the map. Like, it really does. Yeah. It re yeah. Um, but I have, I have a so, screenshot. I'm going to so, let you insert there, Paul. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Oh, please do. Because I have my own, I'm going to insert as well. Um, the, we keep talking about what's the most interesting thing to learn about something and what's the most interesting thing to learn about history and things. Um, my favorite thing about Pitbull is that the Florida Tourism Board did pay him a million dollars contract for his music video, Sexy Beaches, to try to drive tourism to Florida and may have been directly responsible for an investigation by Governor Rick Scott into the Florida Tourism Board about how they were spending their money. Pitbull. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love him. Um, hey, at least he is a, a Miami, you know, native, so. Yeah. Let me, let me explain, like, because, like, the... I feel like the reason I challenge, okay, I have a couple reasons I challenge Jeremy to Pitbull. Um, first and foremost being that Jeremy, both of you really, understand music in a way I do not. You're both musicians. I'm not. I screw around the violin every now and then. Um, but you guys are both musicians and you have a lot more understanding of music technically than I do. Um, and I specifically wanted to hear Jeremy's take on this music. Mm -hmm. Because, and the, the second reason that I challenged Jeremy to Pitbull is I came to be a Pitbull fan. I feel like it's been a running joke on the show that I'm a Pitbull fan. Like, people think it's, yeah. people are gonna think it's the only thing I listen a to. Bit. It's not. It is the only thing you listen to, I thought. It's actually not. <laughs> it's actually a very hard minority of my music. Right, right. <laughs> my only became a, what I will call a Pitbull fan, probably a year and a half tops ago okay um this is not i've always been a dance music electronic music person ever since i'm gonna date myself here but ever since ddr was out when i was in high school um and like i discovered electronic dance music and i was like this right like, right it's a thing that look it's it's either your thing or it's not it happens to be a thing that i like i like electronic music um however like i've never been a big hip-hop person i've never been a big rap person not that it's technically rap but it does fall kind of into the hip-hop genre right um yeah and it, it, hmm. it, yeah it's a it's club hip-hop you know yeah it's it's very club hip-hop and the thing is that like i came to pitbull by accident <laughs> right um can i can i try a guess where you got it from sure right quick Sexy because Beaches. There's, there's, a, there's a certain song that, like, it's an incredibly hyped song. So, could it come from one of your, like, workout dance classes? Yes. 
That's exactly. And, and because I have a dance instructor who in her choreography likes to choreograph, one of them, well two, one who just likes to choreograph to that type of music because it's very danceable music. Right. Um, and it's very choreographerable, if that's a word, music. Chore <laughs> it's easily choreographed too. <laughs> Like choreographed. I guess. Um, I also another one of my dance instructors um is Colombian and loves to do Latin music, so it gets thrown in with her stuff a lot. Um, and so I wound up being exposed to a lot of pitbull music. And out of like, look, you can't be exposed to this music and not like it. It's not possible. Over time, by osmosis, you just become an accidental pitbull fan, and right, you're like, right. But like, hilariously, the more of his music that I found and the more music that I found that he was involved in that I was like, oh, I kind of like that. That's a really danceable song. Right. The more I came to like his music and the more I find out about him, the more I got to like it. Right, right. Yeah. Because like, it's just like, look, it's a never ending party. It's hilarious. And like, sometimes <laughs> you just need that in your headphones like, so like he's like slurs like hearing, mckinsey he just it's like hearing the stories of like gronkowski and his party cruises and things that he does that are just absolutely absurd well, but right. he's a fun personality you know? he is, like, he's a hilariously fun person and my favorite thing you were mentioning a minute ago um in the the video you sent me i actually found really entertaining like even as someone who likes the music right. um, for real, this is the minority of my music listening to, guys. I believe it's just you. Fun. Trust you. But it's funny because, like, a, another friend of mine was like, "Well, you know, like, why? Like, if you told me about why he chose the name Pitbull, and he literally admitted he's like, oh, it's a dog that's too stupid to lose, and they're outlawed in Miami Dade County.' Like, <laughs> fantastic. I can get behind that. That's fantastic. Um, right. Right. And much like the story I told you guys of him, like basically being trolled by a bunch of 4chan users to right. do a concert at the least populated Walmart in Alaska somewhere. <laughs> um, I think it was Kodiak, Alaska is the least right. populated Walmart in the Gosh. world. They sent him there to do a concert and he was like, okay. <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> the best anyone has ever been a sport about anything ever. The video of him is amazing. That is an amazing story. He I brought the it. party. And he brought the people who trolled him. He invited them. What a good sport. What a good sport. That's amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's now on my bucket list to go to a Pitbull concert only because I feel like it's got to be like the most fun. Well, once 2020 quits ravaging our lives, I'm sure you'll get the opportunity to do so. If yeah. yeah, 2020. Uh, <laughs> and this is the thing about Pitbull uh, that I want to kind of make the point here is that People will mock, and I've done this, and I've been that guy, and I try hard not to be anymore, of making fun of people who like fun things. Like, if you like a fun thing, like the fun thing. It doesn't have to be deep. It doesn't have to, and if it is deep, so much the better. You know, this is the thing, like, Jeremy found uh, layers of different genres of music stacked on top of each other. Um, you know, I love good Brazilian tango, uh, like, uh, Astro Piazzolla, um, or is he Argentinian? I can't remember now, but the king of, of tango. Like, I love different kinds of styles of music as well, and being able to stack them on top of each other in the same song, that takes real skill and understanding. Um, so the idea that something that's fun can't be layered and nuanced and deep is, I, I hope, widespreadly known to be false. Um, you know, it's kind of like comedies never win uh, Best Picture anymore. You know, I, I don't know what the last comedy was to win Best Picture, but um, it's a shame that we don't Fair have this idea. Well, the thing is, we don't just have movies. We, we, look down, we look down on movies that are just known as a comedy. Like, That's true. Good point. Yeah. You could call the movie City Lights, which... I mean, uh, has been referred to as the greatest movie ever made by plenty of people like Orson Welles, uh, and it is incredible as a comedy, but it contains so much emotion and is just a, a masterwork of brilliance that calling it just a comedy almost seems like a disservice, but I see that more as how we unfortunately view the idea of a comedy now. 
and calling Pitbull's music shallow or dumb or all the songs sound the same. You know how many things sound the same? A lot. Really? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a metal fan. There are plenty of bands I have where you don't even know that it's the next song until, unless music. you look at the number on the CD player. Pop music. Pop music. Sounds 90% of... Every generation, yeah. Like, if you go back to the 80s, like, come on, Peter Gabriel sounds just like Genesis, just sounds like Duran Duran, sounds like Spandau Ballet, sounds like et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah, okay, you're going to get similar sounds, and that's okay. Uh, And you'll get occasional mold breakers like Adele that will come along and say, no, everything's going to be piano now. Like, everything's going to be just pure acoustic instruments. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's like we, we, we talk about that, and it's like, Generally, that is true. Like, but we've reached this era of pop music where you don't really have any two pop artists that are alike. I like this era of pop music. Yeah, yeah. This is probably my favorite era of pop music I've ever heard. Probably since at least the Beatles. Yeah. You know, I think that each era has its own strengths, but I think what I like now is that we're not afraid in this era to take inspiration from previous eras and almost regurgitate it. Um, And there's a lot of the eighties that's coming back now. The eighties heavily gated drums is a thing again. uh, And which I love that sound. Like I listened to old Genesis and Peter Gabriel and I love that. Whereas this really heavy hit and then it's gated and it disappears really quickly. It's a really cool, unique sound. And that's come back a lot in a lot of modern music. There's a lot of, interesting different unique pop and part of it is that you know as rock kind of goes out of favor um i love hearing bands like a wall nation or bishop briggs that brings in heavy keyboards that almost takes the place of distorted guitar like if you listen to bishop briggs uh dead man's arms like if you it, it's not that big of a stretch to just add in some distorted guitar to that and it's a, suddenly a doom stoner doom song like it's not like it, it would be a sleep song, yeah. no problem. Like th- th- then you have you know uh, Ariana Grande, which you would consider more of a traditional pop artist, right? Th- then you have the likes of say Billie Eilish, which you know she just does whatever she wants. Yeah, what do you like, mean? She like, yeah, yeah. She does. She does a lot of different styles of music, and then uh, then um. But I forget her name. Uh, does like 50, 50 style. Uh, why did I? You, you like her too, Sydney. Um, uh, um, Lana Del Rey? Yeah, Lana Del Rey. It's like uh, she has That's a like completely a <laughs> Americana 50 style of music, you know? Mm. Right. Very and, vintage tone, very like. I love that these things can coexist, you know, that it's all pop, uh, especially yeah. because we had such a, a homogeny with like country in the last 10 years um, mm-hmm. where, where, you know, there's so much was, that was forced to like, it has to be this chord progression. Uh, and literally there's a video you can watch on YouTube where they took like the four top four uh, country songs on the charts and layered them on top of each other. And it was the same chord progression at the same rate like literally the same beats per minute. Uh, it, it, and it's a beautiful thing. And they just switch back and forth randomly. And like, it just sounds, and then they, at the end, they stack all four on top of each other. And it just sounds like the same song. Uh, and so having like variety and people who take chances, a lot of that, I think we got because of YouTube and the ability for people to just put stuff out there. Uh, and that, you know, record companies aren't the ones controlling the sound that you hear anymore. Um, I mean, that definitely was a big change from when I started in radio back in 2007, when YouTube was this thing that was for geeks and, uh, you know, kind of people who were just really uh, interested in just kind of getting their own. Yeah, it's all about, you know, me getting my video out there for fun. And then suddenly everybody starts realizing, oh, this is a great platform for getting things out like music. And then you get people who become huge because of YouTube. And it makes the playing field even, and people start taking chances again, because you can. Yeah. Um, but real quick, I, I want to, because I do want to hear more of Jeremy's take on. Oh, yeah. Let's not get too far away from Pitbull here, because, yeah, I do want to hear more. Because you guys knew a lot of songs, man. He did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, quite a few. It's like, 
I have a, a few more examples, like there's specifically like getting, he's talking more about his later music because, you know, the earlier music just didn't make an impression on me. It sounds like typical club music that, you know, it, it, like people wonder why he's had such long-term success. So the reason why he's had this long-term success is most club music, when they don't change their sound he has had this ability to evolve, you know, like, mm -hmm. like if you listen to the first Pink Floyd album, it is completely different from the last Pink Floyd album. If you look at Radiohead, their first album all the way back in their early nineties is absolutely, is much more grunge and all that stuff. And then you look, listen to uh, Moon Shape Pool that just came out a few years ago. It's straight up, you know, you got stringed instruments and, uh, it's much more experimental rather than uh, rather than just straight up normal grunge music. Right. So it, his ability to evolve. So it was like he he uh, did a song with uh, I think it was Kesha, a song called Timber. Mm -hmm. Timber has this almost bluegrass feel to it, but like I almost think this song inspired a a lot of country to do what they're doing nowadays because mm -hmm. a lot of country pop is like originally they went like the pop rock route but now yeah. like you have places like wild gregs and things like that that are more of a club atmosphere and you, you you want you get you want to get your two-step song into these uh country music bars that have huge dance floors and rather than you know doing uh, uh square dancing they're club dancing right so the song timber i feel like almost set the template that all these other country artists have started following in the way they do it and like now of course he yeah. doesn't have you know a country cadence and neither does kesha so so I know, they managed to pull that off and like yeah. that's a Great example of a song that, like, I'll tolerate it now, but I hated that song when I first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I, it's not it, a bad it's song. Best it's song. Not, definitely not a uh, one of my favorites, but. Uh, it's not bad once you get. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I, I use that as an example because it, it is the things that he's doing with yes. music that's different. He, he also has. Um, which one is it? Uh, feel this moment. Feel mm -hmm. this moment. You t literally takes. I, I I forgot the name of the song, but it's. <laughs> he takes that rhythm and turns it into rather than rather than this like fun little pop song, he turns it into a club song and puts different lyrics over the top of it. So it's interesting, like, it is clearly just a sample of that song turned into a club music. So that, that's, that's the, the interesting thing I discovered about Pitbull is the fact that despite the fact that everybody says all his music sounds the same, there is clear defining things that he does that are different than other people, and he has changed over time. So. Yeah, I think that's a criticism that a lot of people levy against something that they either haven't heard a lot of or just don't like and it's not familiar. Is it, ah, it all sounds the same. It's a very easy, dismissive, I mean, you can say that about Mozart. Mozart's pieces all sound the same. They all do. They're all this, just a Pagetora city. And if you're a music nerd, you know what I mean. Um, dee -dee -dee -da. Yeah, that the same melody in every freaking thing. But, <laughs> go ahead. But, but yeah, but it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's an easy criticism to make. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a frustrating one. You know, like I could say, oh yeah, Pitbull songs all sound the same. You know how many Pitbull songs I've heard? Like two. So <laughs> you've heard more, you just don't know it. Like, and, that's, and that's fair. And that's true. That's true. You know, I'm not aware that they're Pitbull songs. It's just very easy to, to dismiss something. And like, yeah, you know, they might sound the same because they're by the same artist. That's mm -hmm. what happens when one person does something is that they make another oh, yeah. thing and it sounds like them. Yeah, it's like, listen to any band that's been around a long time. It doesn't matter how much they change. There is going to be core motifs that they typically use. Mozart yeah. is a fantastic example of that. Yeah. You know, 
it's like Pink Floyd is always going to have those weird diminished sounds to it and things like that. So you, you're just always going to have those elements to those yeah. bands. But it doesn't mean everything sounds exactly the same. I do want to touch on something, though, because like I, I do like the comparison that you make to comedy movies, which, as we all know, I'm not particularly a fan of. Um, but like the thing is, at the end of the day, it's yes, is there some deep technicality to some of the songs? Probably. Um, at the end of the day, is it basically just fun music? Yeah, the lyrics aren't deep. <laughs> the lyrics are not deep. <laughs> the lyrics are not deep. But they don't okay. have to be. They don't have that to is, be. You know, that is not they his goal. They don't have to be. That's not his goal. That's not, I don't feel like that's what he came to the party for. No. And the thing is, there's, there's something that's just okay about music just either being fun or like motivating like i don't even lie like people of florida when i listen to, to pump myself up in the car like for real estate deals <laughs> volbeat. there's nothing more motivating than pitbull okay guys warriors call volbeat pitbull believe you can do anything and oh, if you man. think of pitbull li- their lyrics you can do anything too <laughs> oh yeah man like there's a by by talking about volbeat a warrior's calls like he has a he has a song that's called i believe we will win and that song is like making the list of one of my like the Warriors Call is my favorite hype song of all time. Right, that right. song is phenomenal. Then you know, like I have uh, a few other songs, but the song "I Believe We Will Win" it pumps you up. It's like that's cool. I believe. Say say I believe in this. I believe. I believe we. I believe we. And it's like I believe we will win. I will believe. Like, so it, it, it's just yeah it gets you. Your blood pumping. And it's like, it's not a deep song at all, but guess what? His goal, his goal was not to make a complex masterpiece. His goal was to hype you up, and he succeeded. Look, I, yeah. lo- I love some deep music. Um, you know, Lana Del Rey is a good example. Um, yeah. But I, I love some deep, dark, terrible music. But sometimes, like, there's nothing wrong with hype music. There's nothing wrong with fun music. And if you don't believe me, go to some weddings and listen to a bad selection at a reception. Mm. Hell yeah. Get okay. that Backstreet Boy song going for me. This Ooh. is something that really frustrates me about, like, people dismiss, and I've done this, again, and I'm calling myself out here, is the, oh, well, that's easy music and that's shallow. I'm like, cool, you do it. You go out and you make a following like he did. Go ahead and do those performances like he does. Get a crowd as interested in what you're doing as what he does. Because that's a whole different skill aside from the technical aspects of, okay, maybe you're a better singer, maybe you're a better music, uh, you know, instrumentalist or whatever, but you didn't make 100,000 people feel as good, as fast, as Pitbull just did right there. Showmanship is a thing that we've forgotten about. Mm-hmm. We, don't, we don't count it as a skill. We don't count it as a skill anymore. There is a skill to creating a show, creating an identity, yes. creating. Yes. It's what Kiss did. It's what, yep. it's like, like, I don't care what you think of Gene Simmons. Gene Simmons, brilliant in the marketing arena. Yeah. He's like, not a great bass player. He's not a yeah. great. I he's mean, although they're brilliant at marketing that man, though. Brilliant marketing. And the thing is, and the songs are, are harder than people give credit for because when I had to learn, as you can see, I've had to play a lot of Kiss over the years. And the songs were harder than you give them credit for. Uh, and even if they were super easy, you try playing those songs in platform soles, in spandex, in makeup, with a wig on, while there's confetti and com- higher techniques going on around you and people grabbing you in the front row. You do it. Like, that's the thing that always gets look, me with these people. It's like, oh, it's so easy. You do it. Look, look at the vocal quality of, like say Beyonce when she's doing full on dance moves and tight clothing oh. and things like that. Yeah. It's like how do you do that? That is that is remarkable. All right. Performing is an art. Yes. Separate from music. It is. And the man can perform whatever you think of yeah. him. Like if you want to be really impressed at a vocal performance someday, Google uh Axel Rose I, I forget Axel Rose running. I guess there's he's he's doing knock 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 on heaven's door, and he's sprinting around the stadium. And if you had your eyes shut, you wouldn't know he was running because he's singing perfectly 
well in a full gallop around the stadium. I can't do that. I get out of breath just singing, much less while doing a 100-meter dash. And, of course, this is Axel pre, like, when pies were his only food, like back when he was still in good shape in the early 90s. So it's incredible to watch people who are amazing performers and can draw someone in with what they're doing. And yeah, okay, it's, so it's three chords. So yeah, it's James Taylor and it's three chords and it's really simple stuff and it's moving a bunch of people. That guy did the much harder thing of figuring out what moves an audience. Yes, you can play a billion notes a minute and play Yngwie Malmsteen behind your head. Congratulations. No one gives a crap. It's not emotional. How do you, and that's the thing, actually, it's funny that you say that, because, like, right before, I was thinking, like, the thing is, how do you create an emotion yeah. and get people involved in it? Yes. How do you have it? How do you it's quantify that? Random. It's, like, it's, it's very rare to find, like, a virtuoso that is able to draw in a huge following. And it's, yeah. like, this is an interesting opportunity to talk about, like, uh, there's a, a virtuoso singer who is just, absolutely brilliant and he has like taken like youtube and internet by storm he, he's not american so he d doesn't right. like show up in american pop media very often but that's dimash I I yeah i've seen it yeah 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 say I, that I name again. For, I for people right who didn't hear it so. say that name again because i want to make sure everybody gets it because they need to watch this guy's videos what is his name again dimash kudenbergen Google him. Seriously, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> let's not, well, let's let people be surprised at his yes. virtuosity. It's like, virtuosity. look up Dimash, S-O-S, D-I-M-A-S-H, then the song is S-O-S. That's all yes. you need to do. Because virtuosity and compelling music generally don't coexist. Um, I think the best example I can think of in the last 50 years of that being the case is Van Halen uh, because you have somebody who's playing ludicrously hard guitar parts and catchy melodies that you'll go away humming. That is something you just do not get in, because most of the shredder guitar players, they just want to show you how they can play a billion notes a second. Uh, but Eddie Van Halen could do incredibly difficult things and create great catchy melodies and riffs at the same time. And he is the, and that band is the best example of incredibly difficult music to play that is really catchy and fun to listen to. And you know, you still listen, you listen to that first Van Halen album that's forty two years old, and it's you could release it today and it would still be a hit. It's an incredible oh. album. Yeah, seventy eight, right? Nineteen seventy eight. Gosh, he was twenty one when they recorded that, and I still. It changed everything. It changed everything because it showed that not only was there this technique that nobody was using except for like a couple guys, uh, you know, in the, in the finger tapping. And then I'm not only going to do this incredible technique, but I'm going to create something that you're going to remember and hum and listen to and, and think about and want to listen to a lot, you know, and he's, he writes jump and he writes uh, running with the devil and um, unchained and, does the best version of Mean Street and you know their covers are incredible. They do Pretty Woman and uh, 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 You Really Got Me. Like that band, like I can't fathom. Uh, a, and that's why I think that Eddie Van Halen is the greatest guitar player. He's not my favorite, but I think he's the best because he did the impossible, which was make virtuosity popular. Mm -hmm. That's so. True. So there like we are. <laughs> that we're like, oh yeah, and Ru well, Rush is a, a, another good example, although not quite to the pop stardom levels that yeah, uh, that Van Halen got to. So, yeah. well, Jeremy, what's what are your final your final thoughts on on Pitbull? Final thoughts is uh, he is he can be very hit and miss, but don't dismiss him outright. Mm -hmm. Like, give it a chance listen to some of his later stuff you know like uh, I, I i wouldn't go like 2011 onward is a good place to be that is the happy place for mm -hmm. cool for stuff well there you go we've all I'm had sorry. our minds open up 
This is good. I like that we all had things that we liked and either reanalyzed something that we uh, had dismissed or discovered something new. Uh, this is a rarity, I think, for the discomfort <laughs> zone. Nicer episode. Oh, gosh. It's such a refreshing. We've had episodes where we're just this, oh, there's this slog. Uh, we're through the, we're like, we get to the end and like, I, how dare you challenge me to this? Um, <laughs> and, and we didn't have that this week. Um, I'm actually really glad we didn't discuss Borat. I'm really glad that we didn't do it because Amelie is a much better movie to, to talk about and a much better example of what we're trying to get across. Yeah, and we got a chance to discuss something that's very fascinating to me, the idea of like hating something because you're assigned it, but once you're not yeah. assigned it, you love it. That, that's a very fascinating topic. It's like Calvin said, there was this great Calvin and Hobbes comic um, where Calvin was told to go play outside by his dad and he didn't want to, he fought it and fought it and fought it and finally he went outside and Hobbes says, you want to go play outside, you like playing outside, what's the problem? And Calvin says, it's work if somebody makes you do it. Okay, there it is. Even something you want to do and would like, if somebody tells you to do it, you don't want to do it it's mm -hmm. weird well that's our discomfort zone we all got uncomfortable and then got comfortable again somehow uh i hope that you will come back next time and we'll get more uncomfortable we're gonna have some fun challenges we'll do more uh casual fanatics and we're gonna have all sorts of fun discussions about all sorts of ridiculous pop culture things as we try to stay sane in this covid and whatever else is happening in 2020 we, we all forgot about the murder hornets we're all just like ah. Race war and COVID. Who cares about these giant five inch long wasps that are flying through the Midwest? It doesn't matter. Um, 2020 continues to just beat us into the ground and it's an election year. We're going to talk about pop culture and ignore all of it. All of it. So join us next time. We'll talk about more cool things and awesome things. I'm Paul Stadden. That's Sydney Johnson. That's Jeremy Brazell. And we are the Casual Fanatics. Bye, y'all. Toodaloo.